So, since it's uh, five minutes after 12, uh, so it's better to start our seminar. <laughs> yeah, it's five minutes after 12. And uh, so, welcome to um, our great professor, uh, Dr. Wood's uh, seminar. Uh, we are going to learn more about uh, agriculture and food uh, in French. I don't want to talk more, and thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sandy. Where's the guy I see on the poster up here? Yeah. The clean shaven guy. Ah, the clean shaven guy. <laughs> yeah, this is, when you go to France, one of these things just suddenly springs uh -huh. out of your chin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome, everybody. There's uh, plenty of pizza up there, and uh, if you hadn't found found it yet, you can get it now or get it uh, afterwards. I actually brought in some, what would a French seminar be without a little sampling of French cheese? So we've got a whole different... Uh, we couldn't already really break out the French wine, but it would have, that would have been spectacular. Uh, uh, but it's fun, and it's uh, you know obviously a big part of the uh, French experience uh, for me and for our students that have gone over there uh, is certainly around food and fine food, food culture, uh, and all the interesting questions that ag economists get uh, pulled into around the whole food space. So much to, uh, to look at and so much to consider. Uh, maybe just this little seminar will maybe hopefully just get some ideas seated and some uh, maybe some interest in looking at some of these different uh, kinds of uh, projects. Uh, I did just myself uh, have a chance, most of you are aware that I just uh, returned from a six month uh, sabbatic uh, leave over there in France working with the folks in, uh, in Dijon. Just a fantastic experience for me and for my family and uh, for uh, the faculty here. You guys all have heard it before. I can't say enough about the benefits of taking advantage of a sabbatic to step away from the rat race of students, grad students, grants, department chairs, all that kind of stuff <laughs> that, uh, uh, that, that really just helps you get just a fresh perspective on things and, and uh, uh, that was certainly uh, the case for me. So what I wanted to uh, just kind of cover today here actually is our Auguste department chair out here inspecting uh, a high-end vineyard out in the uh, Burgundy area of France, one of the most famous wine producing uh, areas in the world. Uh, uh, but what I wanted to, to do just, to, just partly kind of by way of fun and reflection and kind of telling a little bit about what we did, but also to maybe uh, get us thinking along the lines of uh, some of the uh, bigger, more serious questions, interesting uh, opportunities, I think. I want to just say a little bit about the uh, educational program that we developed, this experience uh, education program for our, uh, for our undergraduates. Uh, most of you are aware we've had uh, a handful of, of pretty impactful, I, I think, uh, uh, really amazing opportunities for our students. And uh, I see we've got Whitney here in the back that has been on one previously. So Whitney, you can jump in there and provide some correction, clarification on stuff as, as uh, I talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I think it's a huge opportunity in our undergraduate education space uh, to continue to build those things out. I do want to just say a few things too about uh, the French uh, food culture and especially with the hat that I wear is, is a little bit more of a slant toward marketing. Lots of neat uh, issues, opportunities, uh, branding, differentiation, the whole terroir stuff. I'll talk about that just a little bit too. Uh, uh, and some of that relates too to, of course, the geography of food and some of the more unique things that are being explored in the European Union, common agricultural policy uh, that sort of frames how they think about food and agriculture and uh, uh, the food labeling. And then I just want to say uh, a few things uh, about industrial organization in agriculture there. And that, that all by itself could be a very interesting whole separate seminar. It's just how 
how agriculture is organized there, the role of cooperatives, the, the way that they organize what we would refer to as supply chain cluster kinds of things, quite different uh, than what we observe here in the United States. And the, in the industrial organization world where we talk about uh, structure, conduct, performance kind of frameworks, and, and I've had that opportunity to look at that through the lens of our kind of traditional agriculture here in the United States that I've been around, but it was very eye-opening to see that whole uh, viewpoint uh, of, of how the agriculture industry is organized there. And of course, we've got, we have to just throw in a little bit of conversation about what's the role of the university. And, uh, you know, obviously they don't have a land grant system. They don't have traditional extension programs like what we have here. Uh, again, quite a different uh, organization there. Uh, lots to say and only just a little bit of time to uh, touch on it, but I thought it might uh, be, of some, uh, be of some interest. And so to, to start with, I want to talk about, just share with you a little bit about how we have gone about trying to build this experiential education, education abroad uh, program. And so uh, Allison Davis, and uh, uh, Dr. Maynard, uh, Erica Flores was involved, and myself, uh, putting together this course that was initially around food, business, and economic development, which kind of casts a broad net. And as we kind of got into it, the students kind of called our bluff and said, well, this is really just the wine, cheese, and chocolate course. <laughs> Who are you trying to kid? Uh, uh, which is fair, and you know, we obviously we wanted the students to have a fun time, uh, uh, to experience a lot of things, and just uh, so many neat things that they're able to come across. This is us, some mustard, the guy at Nestle, uh, out there with some uh, black currant, uh, cassis is what they call it there, uh, meeting with some folks that are in the uh, liqueur uh, processing there, but uh, the thing that that to me is a really important part of the education abroad experience is recognizing, of course, students have different learning styles. And uh, some students are really learning by doing, getting in the field, hands-on, uh, seeing systems kinds of things in process, seeing labels in context. And, and for us especially, what was kind of a, a somewhat intentionally designed, but uh, really kind of a fun way to look at it, was to take students to visit different places kind of along the supply chain. So to take them to visit a mustard uh, farm, a production area where mustard is actually growing. And of course trying to take them to things where they're not going to see that sort of thing in Kentucky. But then to go to the mustard processor and to see how they work with farms and how they're actually uh, processing the product themselves, how they're trying to differentiate themselves uh, there in the marketplace, and even to go all the way up to the point where uh, looking at the uh, retail food distribution, so the big Carrefour supermarket there, which is kind of their version of our Walmart uh, kind of space, uh, uh, to just see the whole food distribution supply chain value chain uh, process there uh, for a variety of different products, whether it's uh, uh, cassis or wine or chocolate or uh, other kinds of products. But the, the thing, of course, that is, I think, really important about the uh, education abroad experience and these kinds of field experiences is to, of course, translate all these uh, Economists can be notorious for being very dry, very model-driven. We start out our whole class drawing axes and, and pointing arrows and labeling stuff that can get a little bit dry. Uh, and Right, Lynn? Uh, uh, but to, to be able to get the students out there to really uh, dialogue and to, to experience uh, what are we really looking at here with these value chains? And what does it mean to be adding value from one part of the supply chain to the next? Uh, and to uh, just bring them out to see a very wide range of different kinds of production activity, marketing activity, marketing organizations, 
uh, individual firms, uh, farmer-owned cooperatives, uh, all the way up to the big, giant international food companies like Nestle, uh, all have uh, their own kind of take on how they uh, look at the world of food and food economics. And so just bringing the classroom to the field, uh, 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 both coming from the class and, and seeing things out there, but then what I see too is once we have that chance to bring those students back into the classroom, the learning experience becomes much richer and they can see much more clearly, here's what I really like about studying food and markets and agricultural economics uh, after uh, an experience like this. So I think our, our efforts to try to get students involved in these programs uh, as early as possible uh, I think will be uh, just a really uh, powerful contribution to our, uh, to our uh, learning framework. The, the way that we set up this, uh, uh, this particular course is we actually had a, in the spring a little one credit uh, orientation course just to try to start to get the students' minds around some of the different products they were going to see, some of the different labels, branding kinds of things that they were going to see, some of the different markets and uh, agribusinesses and uh, retailers that they were going to see, and uh, set them out to just try to do a little bit of background research. The vast majority of our uh, undergraduate students uh, really haven't traveled a lot and really haven't had much opportunity for exposure to these kinds of products, places, farming systems, etc. cetera. Uh, and you can see for some of the things that we were looking at here recently, mustard uh, was a, that whole supply chain was a, a big deal. Cassis or the black currant uh, was a big deal. We actually spent some time in Provence in the southern part of France looking at uh, lavender and uh, not just the uh, these beautiful purple fields that are just full of lavender uh, out there, but actually taking the students to also visit a lavender processing uh, facility and to talk to the uh, processors about how they work with farms and how they uh, go through the uh, product development process and how they are even exporting and connecting in an international uh, marketplace. And of course there's chocolate. We have to, when we're going to Nestle, we have to let them uh, get in on some of the chocolate stuff. But we visited several chocolate uh, companies. Here you can see a couple of our students in front of a a big wall of chocolate products where we uh, visited at the Kyer uh, Chocolate uh, Manufacturers, the actual chocolate processing facility, a great experience just to see uh, this kind of food processing uh, live, even with all the kind of robotic uh, things that they've got to uh, take food manufacturing into this very modernized uh, system but to, to see all the uh, retail uh, and branding space that's out there, a great experience. And then silk is actually, uh, some of you guys might not necessarily think of that as an agricultural product, but it actually does come from a silk worm that feeds on mulberry trees, and the silk manufacturing process is uh, something that uh, <coughs> Uh, the supply chain has evolved over uh, over uh, some many years, uh, but France was actually a very important player in that. It's still in the in the city of Lyon. Most of the uh, really high end silk uh, <coughs> weaving and silk products processing is uh, still takes place there, and there's just some really neat kind of history of, of the silk production, silk supply chain. Uh, that the students get a chance to see those kinds of things. Our silk industry in Kentucky is pretty slim, right? So just a chance again to get them uh, an opportunity to see those things going on. But, uh, uh, you know, thinking about uh, uh, not just uh, understanding that France, of course, very famous for world-class wines, but how do they do their branding and their classifications and They've got a, some of you that might be familiar with wine uh, might appreciate this Grand Cru classification, which actually uh, uh, different from how we do it in the United States, where most of the, uh, most of the labeling uh, uh, anchors around the variety 
designation, so you're drinking a Chardonnay, a Pinot Noir. They're talking about the grape variety. They're in, in France, they're talking about specifically the domain or the, the winery, uh, typically. And within those, within those wineries, they actually have physical designated areas that can qualify as uh, these Grand Cru, the super high grade premium uh, quality wines that sell for uh, ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, and of course, even within the Grand Cru class, there's some range. So you can find your way to a Grand Cru bottle of wine for not too outrageous a price, 20 euros, maybe 30 euros. But I did happen to see in the airport coming, uh, coming home when I was with uh, Whitney's class, a 3,000 euro bottle of Grand Cru wine that a uh, I don't know what sort of occasion you pull out to break out the, the 3,000 euro. As much as I love Mrs. Woods, that one's going to have to wait for a, uh, some other. I, I, I can't imagine spending that kind of money on a bottle of wine, but there it is. Uh, uh, and then, of course, these different companies that we visited, uh, uh, too, is just a, a big part of, especially in the agribusiness management, the capstone class that... Uh, that I'm involved with and, and uh, Yu Ching and, and uh, Mehdi uh, as well. Uh, just uh, neat to look at the, at the company specifically. Uh, this is just the thinking of the labels. Uh, we have our USDA organic label. In Europe they have uh, this uh, 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 Biologique label and in this Rungis market that I'm going to show you here shortly uh, they have a whole brand new pavilion of products that are uh, certified organic that are marketed uh, in this market. So, so in Paris, uh, of course the biggest city in France, they have this amazing market and we use this as kind of a launching pad for the students that uh, is called the Rungis Market and uh, it's been there for many, many years but it's a, a huge uh, market, wholesale, uh, kind of a terminal market type if you can imagine that. Uh, but a uh, clearinghouse for all kinds of food, fish, flowers, uh, uh, meats of all different kinds. Uh, they have nine produce pavilions. Uh, on and on and on and on. It's just you almost have to see it uh, to believe it. But it's a great place to start with the students to get a sense of uh, the supply and distribution of, uh, and variety of products that they're going to be uh, encountering there, but also to see how the branding shows up and you see the connection back to uh, not just the Biologique organic branding, but the, the connection back to the place and you see the cheese and dairy uh, marketing space that connects back very specifically to the, the farms and regions where those cheeses uh, are coming from and how they go through this run just market and then get distributed uh, really all over Europe into all these fine foods uh, markets. Uh, uh, lots and lots of, of meat, meat processing, and you see the, uh, the halal and kosher uh, designations in addition to, to the very specific kinds of uh, cooperative or regional branding uh, things that are going on too. A great eye-opener for our students. The big challenge, of course, rightly, is that we start out this tour at 4 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and it's the very first tour that the students uh, uh, charge into. And so you really kind of find out who's really going to be engaged with, uh, with a program like this. But a great way to start out uh, uh, kind of a big picture view of, of everything. You can see that France is famous for these, uh, uh, there's a breast hen that they serve actually with the head on. It's this kind of famous red, white, and blue French flag colored uh, that goes out to all these kind of fine foods. Here's some foie gras in the middle, in the middle there for you. Uh, uh, Amsterdam, of course, in the Netherlands is kind of the big flower market, flower auction space, and, and uh, they actually have some of the Dutch folks connected down here in the Runges market in Paris there as well, but it's really striking to see just how important products like flowers are uh, in that European culture. And 
uh, once again, I'm taking notes for my conversations with Mrs. Woods. We can surely do better getting some connections with flowers and those kinds of things in our, uh, in our culture as well. Uh, it's just really kind of neat to see how important those products are here in Europe. Uh, so many great opportunities, too, to connect with these manager leaders, these, these agribusiness management uh, folks that have experience working with these different companies. This uh, on the left here, this, this guy here is, uh, 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 helps manage the sustainable uh, ag programs for Nestle. And so this is uh, uh, at their international headquarters in Geneva or in a, in a Vive on Lake Geneva, and uh, just, Whitney, it's amazing, I, I, you can tell them that it's amazing, I can tell them it's amazing, you really have to see it, you're just out there looking over Lake Geneva, up at the Alps, there at this glassed-in uh, international headquarters, and of course they take you around and show you all the different kinds of products that they're involved in, and uh, uh, just talking about the, uh, Kind of future of Nestle, where they're where they're going at it at a uh, amazingly high level. We actually had the uh, the vice president of their sustainable ag programs uh, come in and visit with our students, and they to have a vice president from a company like Nestle come in and meet with uh, 15, 17 students from UK. That's a big deal, uh, and it's. Actually, it was kind of neat because he's, a, uh, he's good friends with uh, Pierce Lyons here at Alltech, and they're exploring some, uh, for some of you guys uh, might be uh, interested, they're actually exploring some ways to do some joint venture things uh, with Alltech and Nestle as they're trying to move into the dairy market, whoops, uh, in China. And uh, 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 some kind of neat visions there, but very down to earth uh, people and just really rolled out the red carpet for us. Uh, this guy in the in the middle here is a uh, was a manager at one of the big Carrefour markets and really kind of showed us not only all the different uh, space on the floor but kind of the behind the scenes tour and uh, really showing the students all about the food retailing business and logistics and uh, the French food supermarkets are uh, quite different. They they do a lot of in store bakeries, for example, and a much larger selection of cheeses and fresh fish and uh, the kind of connecting with what the French food world is looking for, butcher shops that do a lot of custom meat things. Uh, more I'd love to un unpack on this. One of the things that I see as a tension there that's emerging in the French food economy is you have the growth of the supermarket industry, much like what we see here in the United States, but a lot more still remaining with the small artisan uh, food shops. So the little patisserie, boulangerie, fromagerie, all these people selling breads and cheeses and uh, meat products that is sort of like your little local butcher shop. We can't hardly find a little local butcher shop anymore. Right or a little local independently owned bakery, uh, a few of those places try to try to find a way to kick up and connect with the local food space uh, and fine food <clears throat> space that we have here. But uh, they're everywhere there. So the the interesting thing for me to observe about the food economy there is just watching to see how this whole thing might play out. And the manager at the at the Carrefour market was pretty pointed to say, we want our butcher shop, for example, to uh, take market share and to put out of business all these little tiny, what he calls, inefficient little butcher shops. Uh, but the French food consumer does not seem to be particularly interested in that. They're very loyal to their little local uh, places, having fresh food that's just a block away, uh, I lived a half a block from my favorite little patisserie just down the street where I could go and get my two fresh made baguettes that, that very morning for uh, uh, two of them for a, a euro and a half and hot right out of the ovens. I can't, I can't find that in the city of Lexington uh, here and those, those, that French food culture is just very different there and so 
Uh, and then this guy, I'll just mention here on the, on the end here, another very interesting story about, this is actually in Switzerland. Uh, this guy uh, works with uh, this very special breed of cows called the heron cows that uh, it's such a complex ownership program to describe where farmers own the cows, they really operate as a cooperative, they will uh, send these cows to farms that are that will lease pasture way up in the Alps where they want to uh, uh, have them for certain times of the year. They're essentially milking uh, these cows for uh, very special cheese products that uniquely come from this heron breed. But everybody that's involved in this process has huge ownership in this unique, I'll just call it a heritage breed, uh, uh, but so much uh, tradition and character and unique distinctive characteristics about uh, uh, these animals and to walk up there in the Alps and hear these big cows kind of walking up and down the Alps with these big bells clanging away on them it's really uh, it's really an amazing experience and, and uh, just to see how protective they are of the French and Swiss and, and, and that kind of uh, part of the country culture of agriculture uh, is really uh, is really neat and impressive and obviously very proud of not just their products but their uh, but their place so uh, just a few things on uh, French food culture I've been kind of talking about it as we uh, as we go here they are really focused on this idea of, of the in the French it's haute cuisine the high food uh, uh, idea and of course not everybody eats the, the uh, high food high quality very expensive stuff all the time uh, but you do see the pretty commonplace French person very much placing a premium on fresh food uh, uh, minimum storage at home minimum processed a uh, lot of a uh, uh, home cooking, home preparation of products, fresh produce uh, everywhere, uh, and a much more diverse diet, a lot less emphasis on, uh, in our food culture, and this is a real eye-opener for the students, uh, where in our culture we have a much stronger emphasis on convenience, drive-throughs, fast food, commodity culture. We want to find the same thing uh, at a Chili's here in Lexington as we would find at a Chili's out in Los Angeles and that's our food culture and uh, it's really <laughs> it's really uh, an interesting contrast and, and it's hard not to come out and, and, and look at it somewhat critically and frankly the, the French food consumer does look at the American food culture with a little bit of a nose in the air uh, and saying we don't want to be like that. We want to preserve the unique characteristics of our food and uh, have the preserve the uh, regional uh, uh, unique kind of characteristics of, of food. But they they do do a lot of branding and a lot of differentiation uh, uh, there. But a lot of it is connected with this uh, this uh, terroir. I want to see if I can pull up this. Uh, I tried to connect this link here uh, to show you. We visited uh, in Lyon. <clears throat> I'm not going to show you all these things. It pulls up here all the course. In, in Lyon, just to kind of give you an idea of the high food, this oat cuisine uh, is a and most of the big cities in, in France and across Europe have these markets that are uh, basically fine food market centers for uh, restaurants that are buying products from them, from high-end consumers that are really uh, uh, placing a premium on these kinds of things. And so we visited this uh, uh, Paul Bocuse. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, kind of a famous French chef. Uh, uh, the market was actually named after this guy. I'll just skim through a bunch of pictures here. 
uh, to just kind of give you a little bit of an idea of this is what our students get a chance to kind of walk through and see uh, these kinds of products and it's just on and on and on uh, row after row after row of all these uh, fine food and, and wine of course as you see there uh, things that you, you uh, uh, can come across here that are you just don't see in our in our food culture certainly not in Lexington unfortunately uh, uh, and they get to you know these loaf kinds of things are, are popular over there rightly where rabbit loaf, uh, foie gras loaf, uh, take your pick whatever kind of French product might be in a loaf loaf uh, 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 is kind of a uh, uh, an illustration again of just the the premium that the that the French consumers place on this high food, unique food uh, kind of characteristic that uh, connects geographically, connects uh, with their uh, their traditions. Uh, that uh, again, for a lot of these uh, traditions, we're talking about uh, food cultures that go back. Uh, uh, cheese recipes, for example, that uh, were initially put together back in the 1200s and they've been using making cheese with the same kind of recipe for uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and uh, very proud of those kinds of traditions. One of the fun things, I don't, you can't quite make it out very well here, but uh, we took the students down to a, uh, to a farm not too far out of Lyon that uh, 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 grows olives and some other uh, products there as well, but primarily an olive operation. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, they, the guy brought in a chef and he went, took us up into the, uh, into the olive groves, pulled out the wine, pulled out all the fine foods, and uh, all the, we had some rabbit loaf uh, uh, and some other uh, products up there, but just to have the students have that kind of an opportunity to experience uh, on the farm and, and the food culture uh, out in a space like that. You want to go? Yeah, <laughs> I would love yes. to go. Uh, how much emphasis do you think the French put on things like uh, organic and non-GMO and things yeah. like that? Are they as old in France as right. they are here? I would say a there's a stronger emphasis on the organic label. Uh, and I would say a stronger emphasis on uh, uh, environmental labeling generally. Uh, uh, obviously a much stronger emphasis on labeling where the food comes from, the terroir kind of idea. Uh, but it wasn't ubiquitous. No, it, it, no. It, really their emphasis seemed to be more on taste and quality. Right. So right. if the <clears throat> organic could provide good taste and good quality. Right. Then that would be great. Right. Yeah. A huge emphasis on that premium quality. So the like with the wine, when you have your Grand Cru, Premier Cru, those labels are quality designations primarily. Uh, and so uh, you know, and so part of it is relates to this kind of food experience. They expect the quality of their food whether it's the freshness of it with fresh baked bread, fresh fish, fresh produce, uh, uh, part of that connects in with the expectations about the high food experience, uh, but it may not necessarily have a specific label that corresponds to it. They just are very discerning uh, and demanding food consumers. Uh, is that fairly? I would, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I'm continuing to work on and kind of took away uh, there's this uh, there's this kind of a neat program called uh, Beyond Venu à la Ferme, and it's uh, uh, it's kind of a food agritourism farm tourism uh, program that they have uh, managed by the French Ministry of Agriculture, and so it's really a countrywide uh, a program to encourage people to get out to visit the farm, keep connected with the farm heritage, where the food comes from, uh, uh, and 
lots of farms that participate in these programs, and so it's kind of a uh, a big part of it is actually a farm stay, so it's almost like a farm hostel kind of a program. So just for example, we had to help our students get some experience of this, so we actually took them to a working uh, garlic farm, and they had sunflowers and grew some other products and had this kind of interesting bird seed uh, product line that they had developed as a value-added product. But they also had uh, uh, this kind of uh, welcome to the farm, farm hostel, farm stay, so that the students could stay in these, stay at the farm. They had a nice swimming pool, uh, so it was very comfortable accommodation. But to actually see the garlic coming in from the fields, the go in and see how the garlic was being uh, processed and to uh, walk out in the sunflowers and to actually see the whole uh, experience. And I see some really neat potential to adapt programs like that with some of our folks that, that do agritourism type uh, programs where a lot of the agritourism, like I work for example with our Kentucky Farm Bureau, we have a certified roadside market uh, program. But those, the, the, the product that those folks are delivering in that agritourism program there is mostly a on-farm retail market and maybe a little farm festival uh, occasionally, but there's not that much, Whitney, you've worked with those guys some too, right? And so there's not that much go stay at the farm kind of a, uh, an experience or opportunity there. Uh, and another place that uh, was just uh, amazing for us to visit, this little town called Flavigny, some of you may have heard of a, uh, this film by Johnny Depp, Le Chocolat. Uh, so uh, it was filmed at this little French town in Flavigny. And so uh, uh, just across the street from where that uh, film was shot, that actual chocolate shop itself, is this little uh, 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 cooperative, women's own cooperative of folks that are bringing products to, the, uh, to this restaurant and cheeses, uh, produce items, uh, baked goods of all different kinds, uh, jams and sauces, uh, creams, and they, and they put out the most ridiculous lunch you have ever had in your life. Am I right, Lee? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just fantastic. But it's all, it's a restaurant that is a cooperative owned restaurant. And so this kind of very unique visionary forward integration strategy on the part of these farms that are out in this very rural place of Flavigny, uh, that it's a beautiful place to visit. Lots of very picturesque places, gardens, and uh, uh, they bring in a lot of tourists that come out there. But uh, 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 rather than necessarily in this case emphasize a, a stay on the farm, they have this cooperative restaurant. I don't there's probably something like that out there uh, somewhere in the U.S., but I haven't found it yet. Berkeley. That's Berkeley? Okay, that makes sense, Stephen. That would make sense. Uh, but the, the uh, quality of the product, the quality of the experience, and the connection, again, back to the farm uh, here in, in its kind of cooperative restaurant model uh, is such a unique both business model and thing to experience as a as a consumer, uh, uh, I just think there's tons of things that we can <clears throat> learn from these kinds of business innovations uh, uh, that we're that we're finding out there. And so I've got a uh, an undergraduate student uh, that's going to work with me on a special project on doing some kind of comparative uh, agritourism, farm-based tourism kinds of things here uh, in the U.S. with this. Uh, uh, Bienvenue à la, uh, à la ferme, welcome to the farm is basically in French, uh, that program. So just the last couple of things uh, uh, to mention that, uh, uh, we, again, we've kind of alluded to here a little bit, moving toward, uh, I just want to say a few things about the, uh, uh, how the agriculture is organized and the industrial organization uh, issues and sort of things to observe there. Again, the big emphasis on the terroir, where the products come from. And so one of the things that you will see very commonly is this uh, label AOC that uh, 
specifically uh, connect not only connects the product to that territory, but it is it is a label that is uh, a geographic label that is protected by uh, this group called the IANO. Basically, it's, it would be like the National Department of Agriculture that uh, uh, gets very anxious and excited about somebody even over in the United States using one of these labels wrongly and lawsuits will be filed and uh, things hammered out in courts over uh, the, uh, uh, what they would regard as the inappropriate labeling, use of labeling and brand names <coughs> that they've so carefully developed that are connected to those places. Yeah. So were those guys behind the champagne curve? Exactly. Exactly. Champagne is a classic one. So they would get actually excited about even uh, uh, the folks from Apple actually came up with a color for one of the cases there that they called champagne. And <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want any part of that. Uh, is there something like Vidalia and those? <clears throat> yeah, very similar. Very similar to that. So we have we do add these marketing orders. Uh, in the United States that do these kind of brand to, to place. And so we can't grow Vidalia onions in Kentucky. It can only be grown in this very specific area of Georgia, right? And so it's a very similar uh, concept, exactly. And so the, like the, if you get a chance to try this over here, there's actually a Roquefort cheese uh, that's a sheep cheese with a very special, it's a blue cheese, if ever, any of you guys have ever experienced those. Uh, products before. It's moldy uh, and very strong taste, uh, but they love it, of course. And uh, uh, But you can't just go around making your own kind of uh, home brewed blue cheese, okay? Or, or a Roquefort cheese. You can call it blue cheese, you can call it some other kind of uh, cheese, but they're very protective of that because it's connected to the city of Roquefort and there's it's a sheep cheese and there's sheep all over the place and it goes specifically into these Roquefort caves and uh, uh, very tightly regulated. And uh, same thing with the wines. And this uh, this gal out here was kind of uh, a fun gal to work with. There, they actually, She was actually part of a, uh, a special school that they had. Uh, again, we could to say a lot more about their education system that I think would be, uh, you, many of you would find interesting as well, it's quite different and unique, but a, a uh, high school that really starts roughly around 14, 15 years old, very specifically dedicated to training students for the wine industry, to become wine industry professionals. And so this is like no high school you've ever seen. These guys are wading in deep almost immediately into biochemistry, the enology, and uh, uh, all the agronomic stuff, uh, very high-end biology uh, kinds of things, but it also with the wine marketing and, and branding and very specifically training those students to become professionals that are going to work in the wine industry, largely there in Burgundy. Many of these students are connected with the the families that have been part of those domains, those famous uh, wineries there in Burgundy for many, many, many generations. And so it's kind of their training ground. And uh, France has these kinds of, uh, they call it a lycée, this kind of special high school that is, uh, that's designated to try to train people for careers that are going to uh, uh, go into this program. And this, this gal is totally a no-nonsense, crack the whip, you don't want to get out of line with this uh, uh, with this gal. I've made that mistake myself. Uh, but, and, uh, uh, but it's a, a neat experience for our students as well, just to kind of see the different education system that is uh, specifically uh, gearing those students for uh, for those careers. So the last thing I'll just uh, I'll I'll just mention here is uh, looking at the French agricultural system, the things that really struck me is that uh, there's really a very high role for cooperatives, farmer-owned cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, uh, and the uh, kind of collective action to solve market problems uh, is just deeply embedded in their culture. And it's interesting for me, having been, you know, working in this world of agribusiness now in UK now for 20 years, 
and seeing a lot of our farmer cooperatives kind of flame up, flame off, and flame out, uh, and not really that, uh, farmers don't immediately think we need to form a cooperative to go after a market opportunity. Very different there, and so one of the biggest cooperatives, a grain um, a marketing cooperative primarily, uh, that the students get a chance to visit is called the Dijon Cereals, a large grain uh, operation that does so much more than that. So they have a, uh, uh, you can see in this bottom picture, you can't see it very well, but we're visiting a, uh, an organic flour mill that's owned by the cooperative. The cooperative owns a network of retail garden centers that, uh, you know, it's like, what a wild concept that uh, uh, and continuing to expand and thrive and, and get connected into this retail nursery and garden space. They own a network of uh, uh, bakeries, of course, that are using these flower products and for the students to see, oh, this is a festival uh, 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 patisserie here that, that's actually owned by these farmers and the farmers <coughs> forward integrating through their cooperative to do very creative things in processing, in uh, creating these network of retail spaces. Uh, a ton to learn there. You know, it would. Uh, we've kind of put cooperative stuff uh, on the shelf. We've sunsetted our our uh, <clears throat> most of our co-op training stuff uh, that we've had in many of our land grant schools. Uh, but I think. There's still a ton to learn there in terms of how to how do we find ways to help farmers move toward more viable, sustainable business models. Uh, uh, very eye-opening for me, and lots more we could say about that. But part of part of the reason why you see the cooperatives so successful is you actually have these very strong. Uh, they, this bottom thing here, they call it a filière in French. And it's really a, it's kind of a cluster in the industrial organization language, we refer to it as a subsector. And, and thinking about the beef subsector or the dairy subsector or uh, some kind of a, the wine subsector. Uh, the relationship of all these different partners in the value adding chain. The thing that also is very striking to me is the creation of these uh, 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 Interchain organizations. So, in the wine industry, there's this group called Interbev that uh, works both with uh, producers on the on supply uh, coordination, quality kinds of issues, as well as the wineries, uh, and then representing them collectively in lobbying and other kinds of uh, uh, market uh, development kinds of things that we don't really have those kinds of inter-supply chain kinds of organizations that, that are jointly representing those kinds of groups. So some uh, really innovative programs there. The, the French have also very recently through their, uh, through their national ag policy developed these poles of excellence. And so they have something like 30, a little over 30 poles of excellence. And so there's a, actually a uh, a food, business, and gastronomy pole of excellence that's based in Dijon that uh, all, the, all the food companies that are doing uh, 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 both product development and market development uh, work through this uh, group called uh, uh, this uh, Vita Gora uh, uh, group as part of this pole of excellence It connects with the university so they have uh, this kind of feeder system from uh, food scientists and other kinds of people that are uh, becoming professionals that would potentially work with them as employees, uh, as well as with the uh, uh, support for helping to market French food products into uh, Asia, into South America, into the United States. Uh, uh, I've never seen an organization quite like this uh, uh, this Vita Gora, and its partner, uh, this group called Agrinov, is more like a, a farm-based incubator uh, program that has hundreds of farmers that are doing this value-added product development uh, kind of a program uh, with facilities and uh, test 
kitchen test product scientists that are there to help them uh, with some of this kind of thing. Lots, again, that I think <coughs> from some of the things we're trying to do uh, similarly uh, here in the U.S. So do the farmers pay like a membership fee right. or something? Right, right. And they would lease space and they can hire technical assistants. Um, it's an amazing resource, all kind of packed into this one organization to help them develop a, a commercial product. And, uh, and, and, and in particular, the, the Agrinode program, it emphasizes the value-added stuff, but it also helps with a lot of uh, farm-based production technology that uh, might potentially be adopted by other farms there as well. So somewhere down the road, I would love to bring a couple of these folks in from these places, maybe themselves, to do a seminar or to visit with some of our uh, folks here just to talk about how they're providing technical support and coordination assistance uh, uh, with the different kinds of food businesses and farmers trying to do this kind of thing uh, there as well. So uh, just last slide here, lots and lots of places where I think there's opportunity for future uh, collaboration. Uh, the uh, EU has this uh, program called uh, Horizon 2020, and it's a, a kind of really big uh, EU-wide uh, agriculture development project. And uh, uh, the partners that I worked with in, uh, in Dijon, specifically at AgriSoup, were doing some supply chain development kind of stuff specifically with a wide open slate for folks that would want to work on those kinds of things even comparative U.S. to Europe uh, kinds of programs. Uh, they do have a, a, an MS equine program, and we actually host those folks. They come to Kentucky as part of that training program. And uh, I had a chance to, to meet with them while I was over there and just see lots and lots of neat opportunities for us to continue to build uh, those partnerships around equine programs. And they have, a, of course, a, a counterpart masters of wine marketing and management, they, they are looking to Kentucky thinking they can learn a ton from us on the equine world. I think we might be able to learn just a little bit from them on the uh, wine marketing world. Uh, uh, we have student internships. Uh, many of them, we've had this program with uh, Dijon for many, many years, and uh, we'll see certainly some more students that are coming uh, into the department and into our uh, college from uh, from AgriSoup and, and working on different kinds of projects. So there's uh, certainly opportunities to build relationships that way. Uh, obviously, we have our, our sights set on future student exchange uh, trips and things like this, uh, and more opportunities to even place some of our students. This is what I would love to see eventually is, uh, wouldn't it be amazing to have some of our students get a chance to go and do an internship at Nestle, at uh, AgriSoup, uh, or at a uh, Dijon Cereals, or at one of the mustard processing places, or at uh, the Le Joy, uh, uh Cassis place. Uh, we almost talked Nes uh, Nestle and Whitney into getting together on the same page. She couldn't pull the trigger. That's not fair. Uh, but it's just a, a neat opportunity, and, and it's not, yes, some French language would be uh, would be very helpful, but especially in some of those bigger companies, uh, it's not really even that necessary. Just a great learning experience and platform for uh, students there. All right, well, thank you guys for coming out here uh, today. Be sure you get a little bit of cheese. Phyllis, you had a question? Uh, you keep talking about Dijon and the mustard industry. Right. You're talk talking about, but then you put added the word, word cereal, and I'm mm. a little... Sorry, Confused. right. right. So Is it mustard flavored cereal? No, no, no. no. <laughs> no. So, right, right, right. Very fair. So, so uh, the Burgundy area of, of France is kind of the central eastern part, not too far from the Jura Mountains and the French Alps in, in Germany. Uh, but there's a lot of grain production over in that area too. So cereals is what we're talking oh, okay. about there. So they're really they're really helping to manage a lot of the grain aggregation and merchandising and processing for these grain farmers. And it happens to be that their headquarters is based in Dijon. So it's not, oh, okay. it's, right, it's not, it's not a, 
you know, mustard is, interestingly, it's, it almost went extinct in terms of production there. Uh, Canada produces mustard <coughs> weight less, uh, weight cheaper. Uh, you know, they, but they've started to uh, revitalize the mustard industry and doing some things to try to help with some differentiation and uh, using some old time processes and things. Uh, but, and not to confuse you too much, but the Dijon Cereals Cooperative, Grain Cooperative, actually does help with some of the mustard marketing, mustard grain marketing as well. But, yeah. So, uh, what did, uh, in uh, top of your mind about agribusiness in French that you learned and you are cannot wait to adopt and apply it here in the U.S.? Yeah, it's the, definitely it's the cooperative model. Uh, and so lots and lots of different circumstances. How can farmers come together in various kinds of associations to try to pursue different kinds of marketing opportunities? How about uh, labeling and... Th that's huge too. And there's a ton we can learn from their labeling programs, uh, especially how they're labeling, connecting back to place. Uh, so. You know we'll be talking a lot about that. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just curious uh, about the local small shops that you said. Yes. Uh, are they mostly family businesses? For the most part, yes. Uh, and yeah. how do they survive in some kind of like uh, like something like economic recession? How do they survive? Because it should be really hard for them to get a small business. That's a it's a great question. I you know I wish I knew a lot more about how they how they manage this. It's a great question. Uh, yeah. the, the only thing I can imagine is, <coughs> part of it is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the French food culture is so, they're so loyal to these places and they have such a high premium on uh, freshness and quality that comes from these little shops uh, that even in a time of uh, economic downturn, People still want their food, and they place a high priority on their food. And they're not, like what we see in the United States, if we have an economic downturn, people might shift from shopping at uh, Kroger to shifting over to Save-A-Lot. <laughs> shifting from the uh, Del Monte brand to the Great Value brand. That's how we manage a recession, right? <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> how uh, do like, those businesses, are they like, um, getting some facilities from banks, like some kind of loans or government support. Do they use this kind of stuff or it's just, you know, based on the <clears throat> support of your customers and only like downsizing their uh, expenses? So how do they, yeah. I'm just curious. <laughs> That's another great question. I wish I knew the answer <laughs> to that. Uh, to the, the extent that these small artisan businesses lean on government assistance, there's Generally, there's a lot more government assistance for everything. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, uh, uh, transportation, uh, public transportation is fantastic over there. The downside, and this, is, this goes back to a challenge for these small businesses, is business taxes are very high and very difficult for a small entrepreneur to to be competitive there. And that's that certainly if I was going to start a small business, I would way rather start one in the US. Just talking to this one guy, uh, he was talking about he has to pay, if he's going to pay a minimum wage of about 10 euros an hour wow. to an employee, he has to pay another 10 euros an hour to the government in business taxes to pay for uh, health care, uh, all these other kinds of benefits that that are going to, so that person has to pay 20 euros an hour for a minimum wage mm -hmm. worker. And that's, so subsequently you see, especially in the uh, younger uh, employer, uh, employment sector, the under 34 year old uh, segment has a 24% unemployment rate. Wow. Brutal. Yeah. And so, Lots to say. There's lots to say about that. Lots of pros and cons. Lots of issues of how do you how do you construct a good society that takes care of people, but then provides opportunities for the entrepreneur. Yeah, I think there's the 
another question. Uh, I suppose that these local small shops should be like really, really innovative and like entrepreneurial. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And as as we've said, fresh and high quality. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're doing those, you'll you'll have your place in the market. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you talk a lot about how you know they, they base a, a lot of their preferences on, on where this is coming from by region um, right. and, and even transitioning that into, into food labeling <clears throat> on some products. Do you think that, that our initiatives here in the United States are, are in vain compared to, to what they do? I mean, for instance, Kentucky Proud, Real California Cheese, uh, etc. Do you, I mean, com compared to, to how much preference is, is placed on that? I mean, do, do we just seem like we're, you know... Stone Age? So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're a long way from where they're at. Right. Uh, and part of it is because of how their food culture places such a premium on all these different uh, right. characteristics. I think we're seeing st uh, slowly, steadily increasing demand in our food culture for right. those kinds of artisan products, place-based products, mm -hmm. premium quality products. Uh, but there are lots of countervailing <coughs> things that are kind of plowing that under too, with the commodity, Walmartification, mm -hmm. McDonald'sification right. uh, stuff that goes on uh, out there. Uh, but I, what I see in the United States, food culture is a uh, very segmented food consumer. Right. So it's not it's not this kind of homogeneous. We're all the same way. Mm -hmm. We have a very distinct, the locavore, if you will, kind of sure. lifestyle of health and sustainability consumer that uh, has that's very powerful out in the marketplace and mm -hmm. whole uh, food chains and even places like Kroger and Walmart are not ignoring those people. They're saying, we, we're trying to find a place in our store mm -hmm. to meet mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of growing opportunities. Right. Uh, but looking at the very, very big picture, closer to Stone Age. Okay. Uh, and so obviously, if any of you guys, many of you guys have been to Europe and uh, had a chance to kind of see what that food market looks like. But if you haven't, uh, uh, absolutely, if you get a chance to get over there and experience some of that would highly recommend it. Yes. A short no. a short question. Maybe for you and Dr. Mina too. On the education side it seems a very, very good experience for our undergrad and uh, I hear where you're going. Do <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. we have the plan to expand this exchange? Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, yeah. in China let's say yeah. that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that. I, I know one of the richest things that, that we enjoy in our in our graduate program uh, in Ag Econ is just the diversity of experiences that people have with your own uh, food culture, food business, food systems. Uh, but but uh, I think we, we stop pretty far short of an intentional study of those things, right? And yet I know of I know of one of our graduate students, uh, not mentioning uh, anybody by name then, of course, but who went to Argentina with Dr. Tyler Mark and Dr. Todd Davis and did that with an Ag Econ 780 type framework. So did what the undergraduate students did plus. Um, so the point being there are mechanisms uh, available, not that it shouldn't be expanded and encouraged further. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. That process took all of seven days to, to organize, so it's going to take a lot. So. Mm -hmm. Let's do more of it. Yeah. Well, so here's my last slide. This is just me exhausted at the end of the <laughs> <laughs> This is a fork, so they're sticking a fork in me on Lake Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Erica Flores, for uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, photo credit. That's right. Thank you. Thank you.